Hi everyone, uh, so let's get started. Uh, thank you everyone for coming and uh, I'm very excited to uh, welcome you to today's seminar on the topic having a global significance that's the air pollution content and how, how does science, uh, how science does and does not drive policy. So extremely honored today to have uh, with us Dr. Jonathan Samet. Uh, he's a professor, former dean, and a term uh, department chair at the Colorado School of Public Health. Um, he has groundbreaking work in environmental health, climate change, and uh, epidemiology and public health policy that has really shaped our understanding of these topics. And as a renowned pulmonary physician and epidemiologist, Dr. Sumner's journey through the realms of public health and policy has been marked by many of the pre uh, predecessors' leadership role across multiple institutions. Um, in addition to the uh, College of School of Public Health, he also held leadership roles in the University of Southern California, the John Hopkins School of Public Health, and the University of New Mexico. And for decades, Dr. Samet has been a, really a pivotal figure in the global health, spearheading the initiatives in tobacco control, air pollution mitigation, and the prevention of chronic diseases. So his leadership and insights has been fundamental in guiding several committees in the National Research Council and National Academy of Medicine. And notably, he has chaired the uh, Clean Air Scientific Advisory Committee of the US EPA, among many other uh, uh, committees. And a personal note to me is that um, Dr. Summers has a landmark study, the MMAS, the National um, Mobility Mortality and Air Pollution Study, which is funded by HEI uh, -E and published in, in the year 2000. Uh, which this report has really inspired me to switch from what I did before was like heavy metal pollution to air pollution every month. Um, and when I was still a graduate student in 1983. Uh, so because of his exceptional contributions to health and policy, Dr. Summit was elected to the National Academy of Medicine in 1997 and award, was awarded the prestigious David uh, Roll Medal in 2015. And today, uh, Dr. Samet will shed light on the, this critical intersection of climate change, air pollution, and uh, health, and to explore the pivotal role of how science works uh, in shaping the policies that govern our responses to these emerging uh, threats. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Samet. Thanks uh, so much, Kai, for that nice uh, introduction. And uh, nice to be stand. And uh, you know, how come nobody sits in the front row? Uh, you're close. And how many of you are graduate students, postdocs, faculty? Unsure? Uh, <laughs> Okay, so uh, as Kai said, I'm not gonna shed light on anything uh, because there's some things you can't shed light on, but uh, I'll give you a try and give you some, uh, some reflections. And I'm really gonna talk about things that have sort of, I've thought about um, over my career. There's a couple of things I want you to remember. And one is uh, about this definition from a book now long ago on what is acceptable risk. And a lot of what, you're working on what I think about is how do we decide what risks are, measure them. And a lot of what we do is about measuring risk, all this air pollution uh, epidemiology. And then the judgment as to the acceptability of risk takes us into, thanks, takes us into uh, complex societal processes. And I'm gonna talk about those as well. So if Michelle finds that the relative risk let me get rid of this raised hand. Okay. Don't cut it off. Oh, thanks. So, um, so if Michelle finds that the relative risk of something is 1.04 per so many micrograms per cubic meter, what does that mean? Is that acceptable? How do you translate that? And so I, we'll we'll get there and talk a little bit about the process to do it. So how do we decide when a risk is important, when it should be addressed? Well, if it reaches that unacceptable level, and that could be at the personal level or at the population level, and we all make these uh, decisions like 
I stopped skiing about 10 years ago. Uh, why? Well, I was a lousy skier. Uh, but beyond that, uh, my risk of injury was personally too high. And, you know, to finish off my knee on the ski slopes wasn't worth the trade off all the things I then couldn't do. Or at the population level, again, we'd make these decisions. Considerations of environmental justice and health equity figure in. And then there are these other ways that acceptability is decided, regulations, litigation, advocacy, what people think. So when do we move forward? We have some tools, risk assessment, which I've done a lot of, You're, some of you are doing, population impact, cost analyses, cost benefit analysis, a lot of tools on the economic side for doing these things. The work we do, the evidence we generate might, let me emphasize, might lead to action if we have sufficiently solid evidence. And what do those do who don't want to move to action? What is the first thing they do? They say the evidence isn't solid enough, right? And there's a whole industry of saying soft science, not adequate, too uncertain, you know, whatever else. If there's a pathway from evidence to action, I'll talk about how we do that in air pollution and then turn to climate change and say I'm a little mystified about the pathways. And then the broader context has to be supportive of action. Like, let's imagine two different scenarios for the next election. One, Biden is elected, and the other, Trump is elected. Do you think that political context will make a difference in action on the environment? Yeah, I think we can all actually agree on, uh, on that. So here's a very general paradigm that I think works in some contexts. So many of us are over here there on the research end, doing research, generating evidence, and we you know, usually say that the evidence we're generating is important, it's going to benefit society, and so on. That's in our consent forms. Uh, that you know the evidence may not benefit you directly, but will be broadly beneficial for people like you or for the world at large. We do that. We generate evidence. Some of it's about hazard. Is there a risk? Some of it's about dose response. How does risk vary? Some of it's about who's susceptible, who's at greater risk, and vulnerable, who's at greater risk for exposure. And we typically maybe package that up in some way to describe risks to populations, risk to particular people, risk to subgroups. And that becomes part of the policy formulation process. And then something may happen. We may make a personal decision. There might be something regulatory. There might be a guideline, might be legal action, and more. And then if we move back across, so then this question of where does the money come from for research? Can we do what we want? Can we do what we think is important? Uh, the evidence that now typically for moving forward, we put together in some way. And systematic review has become sort of the gold standard for gathering up evidence and moving forward. Who's done a systematic review? Torture? <laughs> okay, so doing a systematic, yeah, it depends. Systematic review done right is a big deal. Uh, and I, again, just to, to make the point, and you know, 30 or 40 years ago, some of us could get away with saying, here's a bunch of articles I think are important, uh, and let's take action based on those. And that doesn't work anymore, which is good, because there's potential for bias. <laughs> Using risk assessment processes, which are done in different ways by different people, different agencies. And then finally, we move on to action. And again, there may be multiple stakeholders, multiple people involved. And this is, of course, a not scientific realm. And I can draw it, and I'll show you diagrams that neatly show research to action. They're just all wrong. Okay, and so this is where the real world uh, sets, uh, sets in. So I'm going to turn to the example of um, air pollution for a start, because I think actually what I just showed you sort of is what happens there. And uh, just a few pictures. Actually, the Cuyahoga River fire, Cleveland, 
the river caught on fire in 1969 and couldn't be extinguished for several months because there's so much flammable material there from the, uh, particularly the petroleum industry. Uh, I woke up in Delhi to this in 2013. Uh, the New York City used to have these famous brownouts. Uh, got this from the Women's Tennis Association, which was worried about playing tennis in four or five hours in this kind of a condition. And here's uh, Denver, which is famous for its brown cloud, which is not so bad as it used to be. We still have a very persistent and problematic uh, ozone issue. So for air pollution, we have funders and we actually move across this whole spectrum. And what I'm gonna do is sort of illustrate that spectrum using the example of uh, outdoor air pollution. So why do we worry about air pollution? I think a lot of the original motivation came from these disasters, and some of them are very well chronicled. The London fog of 1952, the Nora, Pennsylvania in 1948. This is London by day, famous picture. Uh, the sky was completely dark. This was so-called fog, these were air pollution uh, episodes. So here's London. Now, this caught my eye. We had a Monet exhibit in Denver a few years ago. What I like most of all in London is the fog. And what was the fog? It was the air pollution. That inspired many of these beautiful images by Monet. So here's the London fog of 52. Uh, Turn smoke into particles in your mind, sulfur dioxide, and if you have shrewd eyes, what does that say? Milligrams. So milligrams. And of course, now we're worried we have an annual standard, new annual standard for PM 2.5 of nine micrograms per cubic meter. So we're orders of magnitude above that here. And if you let your, if you do ocular eyeball time series analysis here, uh, is there a relationship between death and air pollution? Yeah, it's supposed to go like this. Okay. So there is, and um, if you have really shrewd eyes, you'll notice that mortality stayed up after the fog. Okay, M Michelle was an author of a reanalysis of these data 20 years ago, <laughs> give or take 20 years ago. Now, what's key about this is there's about 10,000 plus excess deaths still debated, and there's 47 data points on this slide. Okay, that's all. And that's all it takes to see things. Because, you know, if you hammer a population and you get this kind of response, then it's easy to uh, detect. This even made, uh, for those of you who watched uh, The Crown, season one, episode four is about the London fog. That's about as far as I got uh, in The Crown. But if you haven't seen it, it was a big, it, it's, Pretty good episode about the London fog, highly, highly recommended. Uh, so if you look at what we've done over time in research on air pollution, sort of flow back to 1950 forwards, originally the questions were quite different from now. We did surveys, we did sort of clean city, dirty city comparisons, the crude time series analyses. And a lot of the question then was, what are the adverse effects of air pollution? They're doing bad things to people. And then time went on. We had the six city study uh, at Harvard, uh, started by Frank Spicer and Ben Ferris, just to get the names uh, out there. I'll talk a little bit more about this study. They really did a lot of the first modern exposure assessment, hanging monitors on people and seeing what people were actually exposed to in their environments. For particles, what was the one of their major findings early on in terms of what drove exposure? Any guesses, anyone? Tobacco smoking indoors. So levels of tobacco smoke in homes where people smoked were in the 100 micrograms, couple hundred micrograms per cubic meter. <laughs> I monitored homes where we had a couple hundred micrograms per cubic meter of PM 2.5 from smoking, very powerful source. American Cancer Society cohort, the California Children's Health Study started in the early 90s. And overlaying these was the rise of what we would now call exposure sciences. 
And we started looking at exposure response relationships. And then this whole era of time series studies began, which were treated with great skepticism originally about the methods and the findings. And then we began these multi-site studies like EDMAPS, which Khan mentioned. And now we've gone to these national studies and these global pooling efforts. And we've now turned to sort of what are the key sources and what drives toxicity? These air pollution is a very complicated mixture and many different features of it vary. The question is, can we identify what makes air pollution toxic so we could go back to the critical sources? So all this is going on. And then this question of how low do we find risks in this latest generation of very large studies has pushed the levels at which we see excess risks down to current ambient uh, levels. So this is complicated regulation. So mechanisms and biomarkers. And then of course, now we look at air pollution as a global problem. And there are many countries uh, where air pollution research is beginning and standards aren't in place. I've been working in Sub-Saharan Africa now for almost 15 years and there was no basic monitoring in place uh, in many uh, countries. So one of the key changes I think has been our ability to uh, analyze, to deal with and analyze large data sets. And I'm sure you have all read my seminal times. So much for that. Um, I'm sure you've all read my seminal time series study from 1981, even if you weren't born. Uh, and I bring this up only because this actually was one of the early studies of uh, air pollution and morbidity, uh, there are 353 days worth of data in the study. And it was, uh, here are the levels, total suspended particles, quite high. Uh, and here's how I analyze the data. I analyze the data with techniques that would be considered totally wrong these days and used punch cards for the data. Okay, and most of you have probably not seen one of these things. This is what we used to, how we used to have our data. You carry around a little box of your data with these cards and there are 80 columns and you could have each one could be punched or not punched. Okay, and these were, these were first developed by Hollerith for the census of 1880 or 1890. So longstanding uh, technology. And then we come to the era of large data, the NMAPs, which um, uh, Kai mentioned, where we began to use data from multiple cities. And all this became possible because of advances both in uh, hardware and, uh, and software. And this is our NMAPs team. We're on the roof of a building at Hopkins, so Francesca Domenici and Scott Zeger and myself uh, up there. Uh, for this. And you know, since then, now we've gone into these very large global pooling efforts, national studies, the entire Medicare database, censuses of Canada, and so on. So all this is advanced. So in result, we're publishing a lot about air pollution. And this is a search just for air pollution and epidemiology, more than a couple of thousand papers a year. Yet probably half of them begin with something like, Air pollution is a global health problem. However, little is known about fill in the blank. Okay, and uh, that is sort of where we where we are. So across this time span, which notice we took back to the 1950s, things have changed, and what we've done has changed. We've generated huge amounts of evidence supporting a move towards clean air. So. Here's uh, Donora, uh, which recently had its 75th anniversary of the, this killer event, again, with countable bodies. Here's London Fog. So that was the original motivation. In the UK, they began regulation. Our Clean Air Act, first law, I think, was 1965. So these studies motivated action. I mentioned Ben Ferris. He was at Harvard, a physiologist, a physician. He was the first to go out in the community with spirometers, take them door to door, 
and measure lung function um, in people who were exposed. In the UK, Waller and Lothar were doing studies of people with COPD and other lung conditions, looking at what happened on the streets. What were people exposed to? Now we talk about traffic-related air pollution. Or there was the famous Oxford Street study where people with asthma paraded up and down Oxford Street with heavy diesel traffic. So people were developing these methods long, uh, long ago. Reviews. So here's a review by Ben that he actually did for the American Lung Association. So he began to look at the data. This study, time series study that uh, Joel and Doug did, 1992, was one of this first wave of air pollution time series studies that said, we're seeing effects at levels we thought were safe. And this sort of reawakened the particulate matter controversy in the early to mid 1990s. I will say these studies were so controversial that I was at meetings where people were yelling and screaming at each other, literally. And uh, this, the stakes were big. And in fact, the work that Scott Zeger and I began in 1994 was to replicate these studies, in part because Congress had asked for them to be, uh, be replicated. So this was the time. And then this 1993 paper uh, from the Six Cities study showed a long-term effect of air pollution on mortality. So the key was that the short-term associations, which people argued maybe only advanced the timing of death by a few days, were showing actually an adverse effect that was leading to life shortening, shown by this longer-term study. So again, this was pivotal when in 1997, we went to the fine particulate matter standard, PM 2.5. So things continue to evolve. This is coming out of our reanalysis of all these time series data. It was interesting. Uh, we did this paper. And before it came out, I went to talk to uh, Public Health Department in Philadelphia to tell them this was coming out. By then, actually, because Philadelphia had a unique time series of data, there had been five studies. This goes back to what public health is about. I went and talked to the folks in Philadelphia, and they said, I was the first person who used their data who had ever come to talk to them, which was revealing. And again, a lesson for you around the need to communicate, translate, and to you know, bring the findings back to those who generated the uh, data. So this is, um, moving on, this is the uh, first paper coming out of uh, NMAPS and uh, then more and more now, uh, Francesca and others using the entire Medicare database in a very productive manner. It's over 60 million people and is representative of those who are 65 and up since just about everybody is in it. So, and now these global pooling efforts, I think there's a familiar name right there and uh, hard to see in the crowd, but I found it. And uh, you know when you pull data from six, how come there aren't six hundred and fifty two authors? Oh well. Uh, okay, so we're able to do these things because of the advances in data. The end result is there's a wide array of ha adverse health effects linked to air pollution, primarily to particulate matter and also to ozone and sporadic reports on others, and lots of emerging topics like brain aging for example, down there in the right-hand uh, corner. So in terms of that diagram I showed you, what happens to all this evidence? How does it get turned to a standard? Well, in the US, I can actually point to a map, and I'm going to show you one. And the administrator of the EPA has to set these national ambient air quality standards for six major pollutants right now, fulfilling this requirement. Criteria here means evidence based on the evidence and allowing an adequate margin of safety requisite to protect the public health. So there's a strong public health protection mandate in the standards. Okay, and this is what the administrator has to deal with. The process currently for getting there is shown here. And when I was chair of the Clean Air Scientific Advisory Committee, we worked closely with EPA on 
implementing this process and looking at how to make judgments. So key is the, uh, I'm so upset was supposed to go here. Imagine that circles here, sorry. And uh, that is the review. That's the systematic review where the causal criteria are applied. And EPA makes judgments as causal, likely to be causal, suggestive, and so on. And then there's a, a risk analysis done. And this all supports, in the end, the policy decision. And this whole sequence is launched every five years. They didn't used to do it every five years, but they got sued over and over again, Lung Association and others. And roughly, they actually do adhere to the five-year schedule now. So this is a complicated process. The Clean Air Scientific Advisory Committee, Michelle's currently a member, does the work of providing peer review to these uh, <clears throat> documents. So there's a process. Uh, evidence compiled, for example, here, a forest plot of uh, mortality coefficients, hazard ratios for particulate matter and uh, non-accidental mortality. There's a quite robust body of evidence, okay, which is the point here. So we have lots of evidence feeding into this pipeline. There are other groups who did similar things. So I was on the WHO Air Quality Guideline Groups 2005, and then the group that worked to put out the 2021-22 guidelines. In 2005, how did we do it? We met for a week in Bonn, having written a lot in advance and left with air quality guidelines. 2021-22, we worked for five years doing systematic reviews. We spent a year just arguing about methodology for doing systematic reviews of environmental data. Complicated because WHO uses the grade system, which is developed for the clinical arena and has many challenges when applied to environmental data. So we spent a year just getting that process down. But in any case, there was a process and again, we had a reliance on evidence, and I'm not going to go through the details here, in um, putting out the guidelines. And as you probably know, the new guidelines are led to lower values than the uh, prior to 2005. For example, annual PM of five. Now, if you want to know where that five came from, you really have to go back and crawl into the details of, of the systematic review and meta-analysis. Uh, another example, IARC, the International Agency for Research on Cancer. So somewhere here is me. Uh, I chaired this group that uh, reached the conclusion that should have been easily reached that air pollution causes cancer. I think if you inhale a mixture of carcinogens, it's probably reasonable to decide that inhaling a mixture of carcinogens causes cancer. We were able to do that after 10 days, uh, and including the fact that particulate matter is, again, point is there's a process. And uh, about three or four years ago, I chaired, actually it was pre-COVID, so five years now almost, the redo of the methodology for IARC for reaching these causal judgments. And our complication here was all the new mechanistic data coming from our toxicokinetic, toxicogenomic, molecular tox structure activity colleagues and how to integrate that new information into decision, uh, into decision making. So that's what we did. So again, a process for using evidence. A quiz. You ready? Kai, are you ready? Okay, all right. What does this mean? 6.7 million deaths attributable to air pollution. Have you ever heard that number? Annually, annually. Yeah, yeah, annual. So what does it mean? How did that, where did that number come from? Um, cool. Now, now that's, well, it's published in different journals, so fair enough. That's nine million. million. We well, can make up, yeah. So where, how does that number generate it? Um, the current level of pollution to some hypothetical comparison level, mm -hmm. and we're using the concentration response function. 
What was your grade in Epi one? A plus. A plus. <laughs> All right. All right. So I, I gave you a book to read about acceptable. I gave you a book to read about acceptable risk. So here's the other thing you're going to take away. Michelle was on the right track. So we have the nasty counterfactual here, right? Big idea that you need to ingrain. And here is the counterfactual. So here's PM exposure as it exists, right? And here's PM exposure dragged over to a counterfactual level, OK? So what that 9 million, 6.7 million, make whatever number you want, means is that we have, if the world, the counterfactual world existed in which nobody was exposed, in this case above 2.4 micrograms per meter cube, which is never going to be achieved, we would have this many fewer premature deaths. Remember, no death, no life ever becomes immortal. Okay, so if you have these 6.7 million people, if the world had only 2.4 micrograms of cubic meter of particles, would not be immortal as much as we would like to hope that's the case. So counterfactual underlies this. And again, if you want to know where these counterfactuals come from, you've got to go back and dig into the fine print of the global burden of disease. Do it. OK. So and then we have these numbers. And uh, you know, there they are. And I think, uh, sorry, there they are. Skip on. And then we are now doing this by country and by source which is helpful and goes back to what might be useful for translation to action. You know, do you want to go after coal, agricultural waste burden? What's driving the burden? So that's, that's an important policy uh, application. And then I think um, there's this question of, do these risk estimates drive policy, which is really important. So at the first WHO air pollution conference in 2019, Tedros said, based on these data that I hated this analogy, that air pollution is, quote, the new tobacco. OK, but that's the question. These numbers have gotten attention, I can assure you. And did they motivate action? In our work in uh, Eastern uh, Africa, this is our uh, the BAM, the particle monitor, and uh, on the roof at Black Lion Hospital in uh, Addis. And again, there's particle levels. And they've now done their own analysis on burden. And again, this is to present to local policymakers. So why did you make the analogy to the new tobacco? You know, because there's a tobacco industry. I mean, I think I think that's why. And and you know, I mean, so air pollution is inherent to our societies. It shouldn't be as high as it is, of course. Tobacco is a, just in a different moral plane, I think. That that's why I didn't like it. Uh, so Particles, particulate matter levels have gone down in the U.S., a little more stable the last, uh, the last few years. And then this question of environmental justice and equity comes up. And, you know, it's not surprising that particle exposures are not uniform. This is an interesting analysis in PNAS a few years back that shows who's, gener who's receiving the exposure from particles. And who is um, who is doing the activities that generate the particles? And again, you know, those people who are less exposed are generating more of the particles, and that's not surprising. And then this paper in the New England Journal, looking at uh, recent paper, whether the um, uh, changes in the national ambient air quality standards would benefit various groups uh, equally. So we're not succeeding. So. Ah, I'm OK. Uh, on to climate change. Now, let's take this same paradigm and see if there's any pathways. Does it work? And of course, you've seen this kind of language before. That climate change is the biggest global health threat of the 21st century. You might even have started a paper with that line. Uh, it's a good starting sentence. Um, and you know, of course, there's lots of discussion about the adverse uh, health effects of climate change, and whether they become a, a lever for motivating uh, policy. And lots of diagrams of this sort showing how climate uh, change will affect health. The direct exposures like heat, the indirect exposures, changes in food, 
drought, of course, um, disaster events, social and economic disruption, which may be, in fact, have the most devastating con consequences for the long run. And the more I read about things I don't know about, like climate migration, uh, disruption of food systems, I mean, these, these are slow time course, but we're marching towards them, albeit slowly. And whether we can adapt in time is a different matter and mitigate uh, in time. So if the world was orderly, things might look like this. Notice these nice arrows going from our doing research, making observations, to evidence, policy making, and then we adapt and we mitigate. Uh, and of course, the world is not working that way, hardly, hardly surprising. So let's take my paradigm again and go back to it and say, well, where are we with climate change and what happens along this, uh, along this sequence? So the first is, do we have research funding? Can we do research? Can we generate meaningful evidence that will be useful? And again, for those in this field, there hasn't been that much funding. And it's only recently that the National Institutes of Health, which many of us turn to, has gotten into the game of funding climate change and health uh, work. So research could cover a broad range of topics, adverse consequences, and I've listed a bunch, and many of those are being looked at here. Can look at what we're doing around adaptation, what people think about it, what's going on at the population level, what's going on at the individual level, and whether equity, how equity is playing out. But I still struck, for those of you who've been in East Baltimore, by the landscape there where Baltimore's heat often reaches 100, the humidity is 100%. If you go into the homes of East Baltimore, the streets, there's almost no trees. Uh, massive amounts of concrete and asphalt. People bar their windows for security. And to operate an air conditioner in Baltimore costs a prohibitive amount of money for those who don't have the resources. So equity certainly, uh, certainly figures in. So we have NIH now with its new initiatives. Probably many of you have familiar with this uh, figure, their diagram about uh, uh, about how they see the world. NSF has programs uh, as well, and some of my faculty have had uh, NSF uh, funding. So we've gotten the start on funding. <clears throat> how the evidence gets put together and reviewed have a few things. We have a lot of evidence. So here's publications on climate change and health. We're getting more and more, okay, just with this very simple search. Uh, and there are synthesis mechanisms <clears throat> like the IPCC, and which provides here, this is health consequences by region with dots indicating the confidence and attribution. So we have mechanisms there. We have the, <clears throat> we're up to the fifth national climate assessment. Uh, I was involved in the first, which was the late 1990s working on the air pollution side. So again, we have discussions there. So we have some synthesis mechanisms. And then we have this interesting um, emerging area of <clears throat> detection and attribution science, which gets to this issue from the policy perspective that's important. What is the likelihood of events that harm health? Is it increased? Do we have more hurricanes, more floods, more days over 100 whatever? pick your threshold, and is the severity of events increased? And there's um, a lot of groups now thinking about this. The counterfactuals generally relate to the world without climate change, how it would have been, and using our climate models to uh, model the world as it could have been. <clears throat> so we're making progress there on evidence uh, synthesis. And then this question of understanding the risks and what agencies are involved, to me, gets pretty complicated. And uh, we do estimate the health impacts. And you know, again, this is all sort of model on top of model on top of model. And again, emission scenarios, climate models, modeling climate change, 
coupling that to some sort of health model and looking at the health consequences under as we are and what could have been or what might be in a future scenario of climate change. And so the comparison is some counterfactual. So a series of models, and of course, then uncertainties propagate, and then people question the result because of uh, all the uncertainty. And then last, and here I'm really mystified, is how does all this evidence play out? And who, who, makes, uh, who makes decisions? So you know, some of it is individual level. We decide that we have one air conditioning, decide we can't stand another summer in Phoenix, and have the resources to move somewhere else, and so on. Community level, state and national level. So there's decision-making going on at many, many, many different levels. Okay, so, but do we have a cohesive approach? You know, we have the Rio Convention, we have the Paris Agreement, and of course, are we meeting our commitments made? The answer is no. We have the new thing, new uh, Biden administration measures under the Inflation Reduction Act. So I showed you my little diagram going from research to action. And uh, I applied it to air pollution, where I think it is not a bad representation of reality. And I've applied it to climate change and health, where it helps to think about things. And now I'm going to tell you what I think is wrong with my paradigm, OK? So, and I'm just going to march through it a little bit and talk about uh, the realities. So first off, research. Is there research funding? And can we do the right research and what's needed for policy? And sometimes that's the case, and sometimes that's not the case. This was in Lancet. Um, a whole series years ago about doing research and increasing value. So they had this diagram that I love, relevance of, uh, relevance of knowledge relevant to application. And so too much work probably sits in this quadrant where there's low immediate application, applicability, and little advance in knowledge. Okay, so you want to stay out of that quadrant. I think, I haven't looked in a while, what was the median citation frequency of scientific articles? Last time I knew about it, it was zero, median. Uh, I'm not sure now, who knows. Uh, but, but a lot of the work we do in public health is down here in the Bell Quadrant, named after Sir Richard. And that is relevant to immediate application and some advance in knowledge. And so how do we get research there? Well, we try and think about it. And some years back, 25, in fact, I chaired this committee at the National Academies that set out the national agenda on funding for particulate matter. And the unique thing about this was that EPA had to do what we told them to do. And we actually, this committee controlled through the finance, finance committees of the House and Senate what EPA did and how much they spent. And this went on for six years. And I think it was beneficial. I bring this up as an example of a targeted research agenda. And we need them. And you know, we need to fill in the gaps. And this agenda was based around addressing critical uncertainties. More often, we're in a realm of leaving things to the imagination of the research community. Systematic review, causal criteria, this has become the way forward. And I would just say that in the environmental arena, we are still struggling with how to deal with the complexities of environmental health data. There's always the potential for measurement error. There could always be another uncontrolled confounder. And how do you deal with this? And you take a risk of bias tool and essentially do thumbs down on epidemiological observational work. You don't want to do that. And, and that was sort of what we fought with uh, in the WHO uh, experience. So EPA itself is still struggling with this. Um, I chaired a committee looking at how the how systematic reviews done under the Toxic Substances Control Act, the Lautenberg Act. The answer was EPA is still figuring it out. And uh, so, and then this question of causality and inferring causality, you know, 
it's yeah, it's it's tough. And you know, we talked before. Here's the evidence. And remember, where did all this start? Where was the original? Who were the original bad guys in dismissing evidence? Come on, Stan. Tobacco industry. Okay, so they invented the playbook that is still out there. And again, I would recommend if you haven't read the, the two books now by David Michaels, I would start there on uh, looking at the doubt industry. There are others who have written about it. Uh, Naomi uh, Oreskes, for example, now at Harvard. So what do you want to know? You want to know if you have good data and can you reach causal conclusions? We still rely on these sort of Bradford Hill sorts of criteria or what was in the Surgeon General's report. But what happened in the prior administration with the Clean Air Scientific Advisory Committee was that the chair proposed that the way we have long looked at causation didn't work. And he wanted a different schema for judging whether air pollution caused adverse health effects. I will say this caused a lot of controversy. I commented several times at KSAC meetings about this and led to actually a National Academy panel to look at uh, how EPA approached it. So if you don't like what the criteria produce for causation, question the criteria. And then expert uh, judgment. And again, you know, you get who you pick. And uh, this is actually, I attribute this to uh, Leon Gordas, thank God, a panel of experts. And again, many of us have served on these panels sitting around making judgments. And it's uh, you know, a complicated and very responsible task. And I would emphasize the responsibility. But again, <clears throat> one thing, for example, the tobacco industry did when we had such controversy about passive smoking and lung cancer, they convened their own panel to look at the evidence. Big surprise that the tobacco industry convenes a panel to look at the evidence on secondhand smoke. They conclude that it does not cause cancer. Uh, so again, this is a critical part of the whole thing. So this um, quote, George Comstock was the long-term editor of the American Journal of Epi. He said this in relationship to this special issue of the American Journal of Epi, which talked about the health effects of particulate matter. It was done by some important people, including Walter Holland, uh, Steve Leader, others, uh, Waller, who I mentioned earlier. And it concluded that, um, in fact, we had reached safe levels of particulate matter. It was sponsored by the iron and steel industry. Um, but, and here's a quote from George, which I, I think, I, I love this quote. Judgment in this area depends much more on the art of epidemiology, the drawing of reasonable conclusions from imperfect data. So then the question is, how do you um, get there? So I'm going to just move along uh, because I just want to talk a little bit about this, the whole attack on the paradigm, which goes back to the tobacco industry. This is a paper I wrote with my friend Tom Burke over 20 years ago. And it was just about the strategies used by the industry to just turn epidemiology inside out. So how do you destroy evidence? Confounding and bias. You turn epi one upside down. Uh, you attack the methods, soft science. You do counter studies, hire critics, sometimes secretly. Create scientific societies and journals, which they actually did in the case of secondhand smoke, and harass researchers. And you know, again, this played out in the Department of Justice lawsuit against the tobacco industry, which was found guilty of racketeering, part of it over misrepresenting the science. And this quote from Judge Kessler, if you want to get into the details, read the Kessler opinion, 1,700 pages. Um, and it tells this whole story. And uh, here's what it did. So um, change in environment. We wrote this at the start of the Trump administration. Uh, scientific evidence does not change when the administration changes. It didn't change, but the handling of scientific evidence totally changed. And my friends wrote and said, what a great paper, which meant I was reaching the wrong audience. <laughs> so anyway, so will all this work for climate change? We'll find out. Just one last uh, thing I want to leave you with. Um, 
Daniel was at, a, at the ASPPH last week uh, for a session, in part motivated by the uh, ASPPH uh, Task Force on Climate and Health uh, that Lynn Goldman and I are co-chairing. Uh, we're, we've set out an agenda around research, advocacy, practice, and education, training. And um, we're moving on to our second phase of our work, but in terms of what schools of public health might be doing or should be doing, I urge you to take a uh, look. So, sorry, I've covered a lot. I think I'm out of time and hopefully we have some time for a few comments or conversations. So I'll stop here. Thanks. Great to be at Yale. And, and I'm very sorry Yale didn't win the basketball game. Not even close. Not even close. No, no. So I think we can have questions from the audience. We have comments, questions from the author. Sure, sure, sure. I would love to hear your view. You know, we have this world of systematic reviews, top print reviews, but a few of us have wondered whether the worshiping at the end of clinical trials has actually held us back sometimes from making progress. For example, it's rare to do not have reviews, even observation data is part of their overall metric. They're just looking at clinical trials. Would you comment on your thoughts? Uh, the role of observational data in today's world as opposed to clinical trials? Sure. So, I mean, there are many things for which we're only going to have observational data. So we, we use that as the um, as a starting point. So a couple of comments. So GRADE, for example, and I'll pick on GRADE because it was developed for clinical trials. And, you know, our experience in, uh, and WHO uses GRADE requires grade for its systematic reviews and supportive guidelines. We spent, as a committee, a year in battle with the WHO methodologist over this point because grade did not work for air pollution studies. So that's an example. Now, I will say that you know, the causal inference methods, which are basically what young epidemiologists talk about these days, are intended in part to obliterate the sins of observational data, which you know, they can help to some extent if well conceived. So I, you know, I think there's um, that tension, but I, I think those, I think there's more and more recognition, lots of groups working on how do we develop approaches for better integration of um, observational data. I will say that sometimes you are confronted with incredibly messy data. And then it's hard to do much more than have evidence tables that list out very messy data. And then we don't have good tools. And then we're back to the pile of experts to try and sort this um, out. So I mean, I think you make a, an important point. And, and the work I've done with uh, the academies around both EPA's IRIS program and uh, TSCA has been directed at trying to develop these methods. So, this is an evolving area. There's also a lot of movement towards evidence-based toxicology, whatever that means. And again, they're trying to work this out. So to the extent that systematic review, capturing all the evidence has now become the norm, I think we're going to have to work through these things. And, and there are groups working on this. And I think even within Cochrane and you know, some of my Colorado colleagues, Lisa Barrow, for example, is very involved in this, are trying to now deal with the observational evidence dilemmas that are posed. So we do have one on after several online, so I'll just pick the first one. Uh, so uh, one of the audience asked, you demonstrate in one slide that country and health research involve a lot of modeling work, which increases the uncertainty. So how can we convince policymakers? And what about the using observed climate health data? So I think it's more focused on the uncertainty. Yeah, I, well, you know, uncertainty is inherent in so much of what we do, and I, you know, I think the the key challenge is how do we capture uncertainty and communicate it. And there, I have been on committee after committee where we said EPA or fill in the blank agency is not doing a good job of describing uncertainties. I think the real question is, 
are there sources of uncertainty that are actually driving us in the wrong direction interpreting evidence for policy purposes? And if we think that A causes B and there's some uncertainty, is it possible that B causes A or A does not cause B? And is that within the realm of uncertainty? And I think that's important to sort out. So I think to provide a judgment as to the potential role of uncertainty in um, leading us in the wrong direction is important. And I don't think we do that well enough or systematically uh, enough. We should do the sensitivity analyses and so on. But how you do that and how you present it, I think is is complicated. And, and I will say in the air pollution world, Michelle, you could comment. I think all the uncertainty of these large scale models generating pollution surfaces for the world, we are really acknowledging the uncertainty of those estimates. I mean, I think that's a major gap that we just don't know how quite to do yet when you develop an estimate that's propagated across 30 assumptions, et cetera. We really don't describe that. So there are areas where we, it's convenient to sweep uncertainty under the rug, which maybe we shouldn't do, but just come on. Um, I agree. I think there's so much model data and sometimes people, it's just easy to use yeah. um, what the uncertainties are. But I think that it gets back to the question of it. I'm a big believer that uncertainty information is not known information. Right, right. So um, I think that it, there's an issue of questioning uncertainty and then using uncertainty to discuss two different things. So I think because of timing, um, Nicole, you have a question on that? Um, me? OK. I'll I'm also an FE1 grad with doctors. <laughs> uh, I have a question for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't either. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, as you presented, you know, we can do the best possible research, but then whether or not our research is acted upon is enough. And I was wondering if you think as environmental scientists and epidemiologists, we should be doing more to kind of translate our research to policy or what your thoughts are on that? Well, I think the answer is we should do all we can. So I, I mean, I, when I talk about this, and I do talk about this a lot in terms of sort of things I've done, I, I think it's a willingness to step into the translation space. And, you know, I used to torture my students at Hopkins when they presented their PhDs with sort of the so what question and what's next. And that's critical. And um, I think we should all be prepared to step forward and present our evidence or participate in the evidence synthesis process. How far we go in the policy process, that's a different, a different matter and one that you know can involve pretty complicated um, personal decision making about how far you want to go. I mean, you know, I testified in a lot of the major tobacco litigation. Why? Because I thought it was important to do it. Now it's translation. Um, so, you know, I think you don't stop with publication. How about that for an answer? Thank you. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, let me help up the slide. I'll not